Good evening. I'm Henry Tanous. I'm the Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Stony Brook University Hospital. Welcome to the Heart Valve live, live stream. Um, the outline of the live stream will be discussing some general questions related to the heart valve and answering questions from the, our audiences that were sent via email. I would like to ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves prior to answering their first question. And I would like to start with Dr. Court, uh, who's the chief of our echocardiography lab. Dr. Court, what is heart valve disease? Thank you, Henry. So um, like uh, Henry uh, mentioned, I'm the director of non-invasive imaging and echocardiography at Stony Brook Medicine. I'm also co-director of the valve center and director of uh, structural imaging at the Stony Brook Heart Institute. So um, we all have four valves in our heart. Uh, essentially, there are two valves on the left side of the heart, two valves on the right side of the heart. The mitral valve is the one that separates the uh, upper chamber on the left from the lower chamber. Uh, the erotic valve is the one that separates the lower chamber from the main blood vessel leaving the heart. Um, and then we have two uh, valves on the right side, the tricuspid valve and the uh, pulmonic valve. The function of the valves is to allow for blood to flow in the right direction, in, in the forward direction. Uh, think about the valves as doors. Those doors are supposed to be either completely closed or completely open. When they're not completely closed or completely open, then uh, we refer to it as valvular heart disease. So uh, if, the, if the door or the valve doesn't close completely, it allows for leak around the valve. We call that regurgitation. That's the fancy name for it. And the most common um, regurgitant uh, lesion that we, that we deal with is uh, mitral regurgitation. Um, if the valve uh, doesn't open fully, and typically it's because of deposits of calcium, calcifications, um, then we call it narrowing of the valve or stenosis of the valve, and the most common lesion is uh, erotic uh, stenosis. Um, if you think about it, our valves or doors open and close between 60 and 100 times a minute. So um, there is a wear and tear phenomenon, and over time we will see some calcium deposits. Those doors are not going to open and close perfectly. Uh, today we're going to focus on valvular heart disease, but uh, it is very important to note that the valves are not in isolation. Uh, they're really affected by the function and the size of the various heart chambers. So when we assess a patient with uh, heart disease, whether they have it or we look for progression of uh, valvular heart disease, we always look at the size of the various uh, chambers. We also look at the function of the various chambers as well, and we look at everything together. Thank you, Dr. Cord. A very good summary for a very vast question. I'm glad to see Dr. Pio joining us. He is the director of the cath lab at Stony Brook. Dr. Pio, who is at risk for heart valve disease? Hello, hi. Hi, everyone. I um, apologize for being a little bit late. Um, I had to finish up some uh, clinical work. I'm glad to be here with you guys today. and. Um, I think the question was, who is at risk for um, valvular heart disease? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, there's many risk factors, but in general, I think that um, patients, uh, older patients tend to have valvular heart disease and in general uh, happen to have um, uh, heart pathologies or heart diseases in general. And I think it's basically a, a sign of wear and tear. Uh, there are certain subgroups of pa patients who are at risk. Um, one of those are patients who have a history, for example, a family history of valvular heart disease. If you have, if you are somebody who comes from a family that tend to present with heart disease at an earlier age, then um, you are perhaps because of genetic factors may be at uh, risk for developing um, valvular heart disease at an earlier age. But uh, it's uh, important to realize that heart disease and valvular heart disease included um, is generally a uh, disease of, you know, the older people. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Pio. 
I would like to direct the next question to Dr. Parikh, our uh, TAVR director. Dr. Parikh, what are the symptoms of valve disease? So the symptoms of valve disease can certainly vary. The, one of the most common symptoms that we see is fatigue or decreased exertional tolerance. Um, you know, often in the clinic, uh, I'll ask patients, are there things that you used to do uh, six months ago that are much more difficult for you to do now? So that's uh, typically one of the number one symptoms that uh, people will notice, the fatigue and the decreased exertional tolerance. Um, in terms of other common symptoms, shortness of breath exertion, uh, that's a big one, uh, especially, you know, walking 100 feet if they're noticing uh, a change in their level of breathing. Uh, sometimes things like chest pain when they exert themselves. Uh, in the setting of valvular stenosis or narrowing of the valve, uh, we can often see um, symptoms like lightheadedness, uh, sometimes even fainting. Uh, so these are some of the primary symptoms that we can see. Uh, but predominantly driven by more fatigue and shortness of breath with exertion. Thank you. Um, just to add to that question, I think sometimes patients do blame uh, their symptoms on age. Uh, when I used to practice in the city in Mount Sinai, uh, there was a distinctive question that I would ask, when did they stop using the subway and start using the bus? Believe it or not, people do think that after a certain age, the, the subway stairs is too much. And that is telling when they come in with aortic stenosis. So um, it's important to tease out those uh, nuances from the patient's history. Our um, next question will go to Dr. Weinstein, one of our uh, busiest interventional cardiologists and uh, you know, most successful on Long Island. Dr. Weinstein, how is heart valve disease diagnosed? Thank you, Henry, for uh, allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, as you said, I'm Jonathan Weinstein. I'm an interventional and general cardiologist at North Suffolk Cardiology, which is a practice here in Stony Brook Community Medicine. Uh, your question of uh, how is heart valve disease diagnosed? Well, typically, when people have signs and symptoms of valvular heart disease, they'll send someone to a physician who can obtain a test called an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound or a sonogram of the heart where we can actually see the heart muscle squeezing, we can see the heart muscle relaxing, and we can see the function of the valve, whether or not they're opening and closing appropriately. Um, there are other tests like CAT scans that at a time can, that can show us uh, deposits of calcium on certain valves and whether or not those valves are opening appropriately. But typically, uh, the non-invasive test of choice for heart valve disease is an echocardiogram. Okay. My light went off. All right. The next question I would like to direct to Dr. Price. Dr. Price is one of my partners in cardiothoracic surgery. He joined us from Columbia and specializes in aortic pathologies. Uh, the aortic valve is not that far from the aorta. Uh, so, Dr. Price... Uh, how is the heart valve disease treated, specifically the aortic valve? Uh, thank you, Dr. Snus. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Jonathan Price. I'm one of the cardiothoracic surgeons here. Um, so I think the answer to that question really depends on which valves are diseased uh, and how severe the problem actually is. Um, when you have less severe valvular disease, regardless of which valve it is, uh, often it is not dangerous to the heart. Uh, and symptoms can be relieved with medications. However, when the disease progresses and it becomes a severe uh, valvular dysfunction, uh, and either symptoms are severe or the heart is overstressed and we begin to think that it's dangerous for the heart, uh, then we have to intervene on the valves. And generally, that can be done in one of two ways, either with surgery, where we can either replace or repair the valves, or uh, with new less invasive, often endovascular uh, techniques that allow us to also uh, potentially repair or replace the valve uh, if uh, the, the patient is suitable for such a, such a procedure. Great, and a great option for patients that I would say 12, 14 years ago was not even there. Uh, it truly revolutionized the way we treat uh, our patients and was a disruptive technology for cardiac surgery. Uh, luckily in Stony Brook, uh, cardiac surgeons and cardiologists are side by side in building our structural heart program. Dr. Pierre, you're the medical director of our structural 
uh, heart program and structural pathologies. A question came from the audience by email. If a patient has a bioprosthetic valve, are they committed to a lifetime of anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy? I, I don't think the case is anymore. Um, I think more and more with uh, um, advances in uh, valve technology, uh, we're moving away from um, committing a patient to a lifelong uh, anticoagulation. Um, if you are a patient with uh, one of the older generation valves, um, particularly a, a, a mechanical valve, uh, then you will have to continue um, anticoagulation therapy. And uh, I think that uh, if you uh, pay a visit uh, to your cardiologist and, you know, go over with your cardiologist or uh, surgical history, which would include, you know, um, especially if you're new to that cardiologist, uh, it's important that you present to that cardiologist your surgical history, which would detail, um, you know, the type of valve uh, that you have. And depending upon that type, uh, you either have to stick with anticoagulation or not. I think if uh, you had a valve replacement that was more uh, recently uh, performed, then chances are that uh, you will have a valve or will, will very likely have a valve that you will need not need anticoagulation for. So I, I would say in general, uh, the trend is away from requiring uh, anticoagulation after a valve replacement. Thank you very much. I remember when um, we started building the program in 2016, when I joined Stony Brook, everybody was getting a dual antiplatelet therapy for a whole year after a TAVR valve. And now some cardiologists are sticking with just aspirin and some cardiologists are sticking with three months of additional Plavix. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Court, uh, you're also the co-director of the Heart Valve Institute. Uh, a patient came in, uh, um, a question came in from a patient, and it goes like that. Are there a telltale early sign that signal heart valve issues or disease? I was told by several doctors they could hear a slush. I think she means or he means a murmur uh, with a stethoscope, and one doctor told her you're going to have at a later point, a valve problem. So a murmur uh, is, the, is the sound that the blood actually makes as it goes through a valve that either doesn't open well enough or doesn't close all the way. And that's the sound that we hear. So if someone puts a stethoscope on your chest and they hear a murmur, Typically, the next thing that we do is get an echocardiogram, as Dr. Weinstein said, it's the ultrasound of the heart, and that really allows us to look at the anatomy of the valve and, uh, and um, look at the function of the valve. Uh, but I would say that sometimes the physical exam is misleading. Uh, sometimes the murmur doesn't really sound as intense, and, uh, and the, valve, uh, the valve is actually not functioning well. So with the aortic valve, for instance, we know that as the valve becomes more and more narrowed, then because there is reduced amount of blood that flows through that valve, the murmur becomes more faint. So um, if you do have any uh, symptoms whatsoever, and Dr. Parikh went over them, but if you do have any symptom that could be suggestive of a heart problem, then uh, just listening to your heart with the stethoscope is not sufficient and uh, you do need to be fully evaluated. And again, we start with the transthoracic echocardiogram. Thank you, Dr. Court. <clears throat> uh, if I can uh, also add to that, because we just had a question come in and the patient is asking what they're describing as a palpitation. Could that be an early sign of a heart issue? Absolutely. So palpitation is definitely something that you want to report to your healthcare provider. So anything that is unusual, anything that is new for you, everybody knows themselves, they know their bodies. If you feel anything that is new, unusual, um, a good question uh, like that was said before, 
what was it that you were able to do before and you cannot do now. Uh, everyone wants to stay symptom free. So if we ask uh, people, how do you feel? They always say, oh, we feel well, everything is good. Uh, I don't have any symptoms. But if we ask very specific questions about what they were able to do before and what they're able to do now, uh, we, that's when we start hearing about, uh, about specific symptoms and palpitations, which is either irregular heartbeat or skipped beats or racing heartbeat. It all pretty much clumped under uh, palpitations, that's really um, a sign that uh, maybe there is an abnormality with uh, a heart valve. That's great. Um, next question I think we'll send to Dr. Weinstein, also from the audience. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, you have obviously a very busy practice with your partners, one of the biggest cardiology groups. Um, and you see patients with all kinds of symptoms. So a question goes, what does the diagnosis of a mitral valve prolapse mean? Is it serious? Are there any symptoms? Yeah, well, thank you. So as, as Dr. Court said before, the, the mitral valve is the valve that sits between the upper and lower chamber on the left side of the heart. Um, sometimes uh, the valve, after it opens up, it closes and then it balloons into that upper chamber, kind of like a, a parachute, um, and it's prolapsing into that, that top chamber called the atrium. Um, mitral valve prolapse is not dangerous unless it's causing a, a significant leak or insufficiency of the valve. Um, mitral valve prolapse can happen to, unfortunately, anyone at any age. Um, and, and the symptoms of that problem might be that you feel your heart racing, like we just said, palpitations and irregularity in the heartbeat. Fatigue could be one of the problems. Um, Shortness of breath with activity can certainly be one of the signs and symptoms of mitral valve prolapse. But um, in and of itself, mitral valve prolapse is not dangerous, but uh, it can lead to uh, mitral valve insufficiency. Great. Since I have you on the, um, talking, Dr. Weinstein, a new question just came in. Can you tell someone if they should be worried if their stress test is abnormal? So. An abnormal stress test can certainly be um, a sign of a problem with circulation to the heart, but it is a non-invasive test. So a non-invasive test that's abnormal requires a follow-up test. And usually at that point, we're gonna get an, either an invasive test that's more definitive or a slightly more involved non-invasive test. So an angiogram would usually be the next step. That can be done with a CAT scan or definitively with a cardiac catheterization. But an abnormal stress test, assuming that there are features to it that make us more concerned, like large territories of the heart muscle being in jeopardy, or if there's significant deviations on an EKG, um, or if patients are getting chest pain with activity, uh, these are signs that definitely would require follow-up with another test. If I may add to this one, uh, at Stony Brook, we also do a lot of stress tests for patients who have valvular heart disease. So um, we, we can look for evidence of blockages, like Dr. Weinstein said, uh, but also for patients that have uh, symptoms that can actually be fully explained by the uh, images that we get from the resting echocardiogram. So if, uh, if a person has symptoms when they exert themselves, what we do is actually have them walk on the treadmill and we do an echocardiogram right when they get off the treadmill. So we can try to correlate the symptoms that they have with the way their uh, valve function really at peak exercise. And also for patients that still claim that they have no symptoms, but we are concerned that maybe they are having some serious valve disease, we put them on the treadmill and this way we can document how far they walk, what is their exercise tolerance, and really make sure that they don't have symptoms. So uh, that's another use of a stress test. And I totally agree that if the test is abnormal, then it should lead to a discussion about the following steps. Thank you, Dr. Court and Dr. Weinstein. Uh, next is doc a question to Dr. Perry. A um, little bit of a controversial issue. Uh, not, um, we're obviously learning more about this. So I'm going to combine two questions from the audience. Uh, one was, how long does a tissue valve usually last? 
uh, if it starts to fail, what can be done? And another patient asked, when something has to be done, should it be open surgery or valve through the groin, knowing that they already have one bioprosthetic valve in their heart? So that's, those are such great questions. Um, and, you know, the truth is we're still studying the answer to those questions. Uh, we do know that uh, with respect to tissue valves that are implanted through surgery, uh, those valves implanted in the aortic position, those valves should technically, uh, typically last you for a good 10 to 20 years. Uh, uh, there have been multiple studies that have been published because surgery has been around since the 1960s for treating, um, for treating aortic valves. Um, with respect to uh, more minimally invasive options like TAVR, which stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. We're actually uh, now at the 20 year anniversary of TAVR. The first uh, in-man TAVR actually occurred um, uh, approximately 20 years ago. And so uh, there are some difficulties with determining how long those valves will last for. So one of the reasons there's difficulty is because when we talk about durability or valve failure, how do we define valve failure? Are we defining it as somebody who uh, now has a leaky valve or somebody who now has uh, increased pressure gradient across their valve or someone who has symptoms because of their valve now requiring a replacement? So there's a lot of varying definitions which um, cause us to have difficulty with actually estimating the prevalence of valve failure over time. Uh, the registries that have been published so far have demonstrated very good valve durability uh, at 10 years time period with the transcatheter aortic valves. Um, you know, one of the other aspects uh, that also come into play is every few years, uh, a newer generation valve comes out that, uh, that has, um, you know, more technological aspects that could help reduce the rates of pacemaker post a valve replacement that help reduce the rates of leak uh, around the valve uh, that are much more slick um, in terms of movement across the leg as it gets implanted. So uh, every few years, we're essentially restarting the clock because we have a new valve that we're looking at um, and the older generation valves uh, somewhat become obsolete as the newer generation valves take over. And then the last aspect uh, that makes it troublesome for us to really estimate long-term prevalence is uh, when we implant these transcatheter aortic valves in patients who are 85 plus, for us to look at 10-year durability in these valves, sometimes uh, you know, a patient's longevity can be affected by something completely non-cardiac. Uh, for instance, you know, pneumonia at a later time that may prevent us from looking at 10-year durability. So all of those factors do come into play. Um, in terms of uh, when someone does present with a, with a tissue valve that has now failed, what are the treatment options? There are a lot of different factors that come into play. Uh, age is certainly one of those factors. Uh, if you're over the age of 75, you may want to significantly consider doing the minimally invasive option, with, which would be a TAVR. Uh, as opposed to undergoing a redo surgery. Uh, but we do take a look at a lot of different factors. Is the reason the valve needs to be replaced due to infection? Uh, is, are there other um, you know, aspects going on, including uh, any problems with the aorta or any um, significant coronary artery disease? So we do take a look at all of those different factors. But um, over time, especially when someone presents when they're significantly younger, meaning less than age 65, and they present with aortic stenosis, I typically tell them that at some point in your life, you're gonna have to undergo a sternotomy. Uh, whether you consider a sternotomy during the first round with doing a surgical aortic valve replacement up front, uh, and then looking at the 10 to 20 year durability thereafter, um, or, or considering doing a transcatheter aortic valve replacement the first time around. And then when that valve eventually deteriorates in 10 years time period, we presume, 
uh, then the other option would be considering uh, either placing another transcatheter heart valve in that valve or undergoing surgery at that time. So we're we're still studying the different algorithms as to what is the best approach for the patient, uh, but a lot of different factors that come into play, namely patient age, um, and really ultimately you want to limit the number of sternotomies. And if you limit the numbers of sternotomies, you also want to make sure that when they do undergo a sternotomy, they're at a lower risk age as opposed to undergoing a sternotomy at age 90, for instance. Very nice. Uh, I think that was a very detailed answer. I thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Price, um, if a patient has a bicuspid aortic valve and a small portion of the population does, do they get offered the same uh, options of open versus stavers or are their options less, uh, uh, more limited in a way? Uh, well, that depends on a few factors. So um, for those who uh, don't know what a bicuspid valve is, the aortic valve, uh, which separates the heart from the circulation to the rest of the body, usually has three parts to it, or three leaflets. A bicuspid valve only has two. And the reason that's important is because often when you have a bicuspid valve, it may be associated with other heart problems or other vascular problems, or it can be associated with a completely different shape of the valve. Uh, making, uh, replacing it with different modalities um, challenging or difficult. Uh, so the short answer is that a minimally invasive percutaneous technique can be done for someone with a bicuspid valve. Uh, but if the valve um, has altered the uh, geometry or the shape of the aorta or the valve significantly, uh, that might be a reason why uh, surgical aortic valve replacement uh, would be more beneficial or more appropriate. And in addition, those who have bicuspid aortic valves, we know that approximately 20% of the population, and some, um, some studies have shown to be higher uh, than that, have associated aortic problems, and specifically the formation of aortic aneurysms. And if someone has a, an aortic aneurysm, that means that their aorta is dilated or larger than it should be. And if it is sufficiently dilated or significantly larger than it should be, and you have a bicuspid aortic valve that needs uh, to be intervened on or to be replaced, uh, in that situation, surgery would be a better option for you so that you can have both the valve and the aorta addressed uh, during the exact same procedure. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Price. Uh, I actually want to uh, add a question to Dr. Pio. Uh, Dr. Pio, we just had a question from the audience. Why do cardiologists wait till the stenosis is severe before something like surgery is offered? Um, I think that there are two primary reasons for that. And uh, one of those reasons, I think Dr. Parikh went over very, very well. And that has to do with the longevity of the valve, that there is a time limit. So as soon as the valve goes in, then uh, there's a uh, stopwatch um, that starts. And um, at the end of the lifetime, uh, durability of that valve, then you're looking for another surgery. So um, you don't wanna put in a valve too early because then that stopwatch starts earlier. Uh, the other question, the other answer is this, um, if uh, the risks of replacing a valve and I think those risks of replacing a valve have become substantially lower now that we're able to do it non-invasively and not through open heart surgery. Even though that's the case, um, there are still risks associated with it. And I think uh, there was a patient that Dr. Tanus and I just went over, uh, I think it was one or two days ago. And I think um, Dr. Tanus eloquently said, well, there's risk involved and you have to know when to take the risk. In other words, you have to be sure that, um, that the benefits of this valve replacement um, is going to outweigh the risks that are associated with the valve replacement. So it is largely um, accepted that the time to replace a valve is usually uh, when you become symptomatic with it. Now, there are various caveats to that general statement. 
One of those was when over by Dr. Court, because, and, and, and I think uh, the message there is, sometimes it's very, very hard to discern what symptoms are coming from your valves. It may be just fatigue, or it may be that you don't want to ride the subway anymore. You want to ride a bus. And over time, uh, your body has sort of adapted, or rather your mind has sort of adapted uh, to those limitations that may be caused by the valve, but you've unconsciously perhaps have found ways to avoid feeling symptoms. And then um, there's another category where perhaps the degree of the valvular disorder is so severe that you are at risk for a rapid uh, decompensation. Um, clinically, what we mean by that is that you might become very, very sick. You're at risk of becoming very symptomatic very fast. And um, to see if you are in that category, uh, that is a category of patients where you're relatively asymptomatic, but the degree of the valvular disorder is so bad that you're at a high risk for decompensating, well, then that can only be discerned by some of the non-invasive tests, uh, primarily an echocardiogram that was mentioned before. So again, um, you, in general, the valve is replaced when you're symptomatic, so you delay the start of the stopwatch that defines the lifetime uh, durability of that valve. Two, um, you want to take the risk uh, when you have to, but the caveats are that you may be one of these patients that there may be an indication for a valve replacement, even if you're asymptomatic. And the best way to do it, to, to see if you're in that category, is to make an appointment with a cardiologist, to uh, a cardiologist that are associated with the valve center and um, get a consultation. Great. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Weinstein the next question which is very similar to what Dr. Theo just uh, answered. So I'm actually ask, going to ask you another one. What follow-up or surve surveillance do you offer patients who already had a bioprosthetic valve uh, in their history? Well, thank you. So, so when someone has a history of, of any kind of therapeutic intervention uh, to a heart valve, they should be followed up periodically uh, with an echocardiogram. And the interval from which you should have one echocardiogram to another should depend on whether or not you're having symptoms, whether or not there was a, a change in your echo in your electrocardiogram. Um, and but even when things are going well, a periodic look, um, either uh, every one to two years, should be performed to keep an eye on those um, prosthetic valves, just to make sure that their uh, function remains intact and they're not in need of any additional therapy. Great. I think we'll ask uh, one more question. Uh, we'll go to Dr. Price. Dr. Price, a question came in from the audience. Um, if a mitral valve is calcified, what are the likelihood or what is the likelihood that it will be repaired rather than replaced? Well, it's that, that's a very good question. I think part of it depends on where in the valve the calcification exists and how the calcification is specifically impairing the valve function. It, to speak in very generic terms, uh, when there is a significant amount of calcification on the mitral valve, it is less likely to be repaired. It's not always impossible, but it's less likely. And that, that patient should um, anticipate the, the possibility of having a mitral valve replacement, uh, even if a mitral valve repair is attempted. Great. Um, my next question is to Dr. Pio and Dr. Court. What distinguishes Stony Brook Heart Institute's valve center? Dr. Court, you want to start? Sure. So I co-founded the, uh, the, the valve center at Stony Brook back in 2011, together with one of our um, heart surgeons. And the idea was really uh, to show collaboration between cardiology and, uh, and heart surgery. And uh, over the last 12 years since we opened the valve center, we tremendously grow in the number of people that are now part of the team. Uh, pretty much everyone that is on the webinar today is part of our team, and we have additional members that are not here tonight. Um, but we also grew in terms of the 
uh, number and the type of procedures that we now offer our patients, both in order to diagnose their valvular disease and also in terms of how we treat valvular heart disease. So I would say that what is really unique about us is that it is a true collaboration. It's a true team work. Um, if you look at the components of each member of the team, um, we're all excellent in, in what we do. So just to uh, you know, brag about uh, the Ecolab, we are really the only uh, Ecolab in all of Suffolk County that is accredited for uh, all types of uh, echo exams that can be done. So that's transthoracic echo, it's the typical echo, uh, stress echo, which we talked about before, and also transesophageal echo, which is a special echo that we do from the esophagus, the foot pipe, and the stomach. Um, and uh, Dr. Pio can talk about the cat lab, which is also uh, a star uh, cat lab, and uh, Dr. Tanusi can talk about the surgical program and all the awards that, uh, that you got. Um, we we um, really view patients as individual. We really um, tailor the care for each patient as an individual person. No two patients are alike. We spend a lot of time reviewing uh, all the data, all the imaging modalities, uh, all the studies, all the information that we have about uh, our patients. We meet once a week as a team and we discuss all of our patients. We go over all the results of the test, like I said, and, uh, and we make a decision. Then we meet with the patient and we have a full discussion. Uh, we also utilize telehealth. So um, we try to make it easy for the patient. And, uh, and oftentimes we do like to speak with family members as well. Uh, it's another way to get uh, information about symptoms. Sometimes it's the spouse that is uh, telling us about uh, their beloved one huffing and puffing while the patient himself or herself is denying having any symptoms. So we like to talk to family members as well. So once in a while we do hold those telehealth visits in which case we can essentially bring all the relatives together into the same room and, uh, and get more information. And this is also a great opportunity for uh, those family members to ask all kinds of questions, especially if we talk about uh, an intervention. And I would say the last thing that I can think of um, is our wonderful coordinator, Kelly, who um, is really a terrific human being and she's a true patient advocate and uh, she really goes above and beyond to make the uh, patient experience as pleasant as possible. So that's, that's my take on our Valve Center. And Dr. Pierre, if you want to add to that. Yeah. No, I, I think I, I agree with, uh, you know, all of the things that, that you know, Dr. Court has said. And, um, you know, I, if I may, I can, you know, try to, um, you know, maybe, you know, s s summarize it if that's possible. Um, you know, I, I guess it's quality, uh, commitment, compassion. Um, I, I think the quality comes from the teamwork that we have that Dr. Court uh, just, uh, you know, very... Uh, uh, thoroughly outlined. It's a, a teamwork of surgeons, uh, cardiothoracic surgeons, um, and uh, the entire valve team that is able to employ the latest quality, uh, uh, the latest technology in an appropriate way. I mean, you can't have just access to technology. That technology has to be applied um, in an appropriate way in order to uh, have maximum benefit for the patients. Um, and we are always seeking ways to really improve the quality of the care to provide maximum benefit with minimal complications. And uh, the reason why we're able to do this is this is the commitment part of it. We're always unhappy with the status quo. The status quo can be great, but we're not happy with it because we always think that there is room for improvement. And this is the reason why uh, we try to get the latest technology and try to do studies, get involved in studies that tell us or that better inform us how to use these newest uh, uh, technological advances that are coming through the pipeline. Uh, compassion. 
Um, it's not just the physicians here, it's the entire team of uh, people who really have a commitment to showing compassion in the care of our patients. And I think Dr. Court just mentioned this and that everybody really, really cares. You know, I, it, there's not a day that, or there's not a day that goes by or definitely not a week that goes by that, you know, I see a patient who after a procedure says, I mean, your staff was great. And in some instances, you know, they're not talking about the physicians, but it's the staff in the cath lab or, you know, perhaps the staff in the echocardiography laboratory. And they were like, they made me feel so comfortable that, you know, I went through this procedure and I felt really good. You know, there was sometimes, you know, there's music playing and, you know, sometimes they ask me, you know, what kind of music you want to listen to while the procedure is going on. So again, I, you know, it, it's the, quality of the work we do here right and that's uh and that's uh, uh made possible by teamwork appropriate use of the latest technology commitment to never feel satisfied with the status quo and then compassion in taking care of our patients to treat each patient as individual and uh, not just uh, uh, a part of a cookie cutter sort of uh, way of treating patients Okay, that's great. Um, for closing remarks, I would like to thank again our panelists, very distinguished physicians for taking the time and joining us tonight for this useful and informative session. I would like to thank our marketing department. This could not have happened without Michelle and Carly. Uh, thank you for our patients who tuned in and asked questions. If you need any further help or we can be of any assistance, feel free to schedule appointments through our websites or through the phones. Um, um, again, thank you all for a great session.